Thank you all for coming out. This is a this is a great turnout. I, I really do appreciate it. I think it's a, it's a matter of the times, really, that people do want to talk about political risk today. Uh, I've shown up in a suit. I know I've been told not to, but I, I've heard the only thing worse than being a banker right now is being an American. Uh, so I thought, you know, why not? Um, the book is called The Fat Tale. Um, and, uh, let me first, very briefly, for most people know what fat tales are all about, but I mean, in, in non-technical language, the notion that these one in 100 year storms are increasingly seeming to hit us every 15 minutes. That's a fat tale, as opposed to the expectation of a thin tale, of a normal distribution where dire events happen with relatively low frequency. Now, lots of people, we all know that these fat tales are out there. The purpose of my book is to say that in today's environment, increasingly, the fat tales that are affecting our global economy are driven by politics, for good and for bad. And that if we understand that, we can have a better capacity to anticipate those risks, to hedge those risks, and sometimes even to manage those risks. So that is the conceit behind the book. Two major things that are happening in the world structurally that I think make politics matter more. First, over the last 20 years, there was one thing as executives, as policymakers, as investors, as pensioners, as people affected by the global economy, that we had to get right. If we did not get this right, we did badly. That was globalization. We had to understand that multinational corporations were increasingly becoming the dominant economic actors on the world stage, taking advantage of global economies of scale, global labor rate differentials, global consumer markets, global supply chains. If we got that wrong, we missed out. Tom Friedman sold three million copies of The World is Flat in the United States. God bless anyone that can get three million Americans to read about the rest of the world. <laughs> because he recognized this fact and made it comprehensible and digestible to a general reading audience. That world is gone. We are no longer in a world where multinational corporations are becoming more important for the global economy. We are in a world where states are increasingly becoming the dominant economic actor. That started a long time ago with national oil corporations taking over from independent oil corporations. 1973, the oil shock, OPEC. Then over the last 20 years, the rise of emerging markets and the BRICS, along with them state-owned enterprises and privately-owned national champions. Then five years ago, the rise of sovereign wealth funds. Been around for decades, but there was no term sovereign wealth fund until five years ago when they became much more important in portfolio investment. And then, much more significantly, six months ago, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and the international political capitals became utterly critical in determining who the winners and losers were going to be. Stimulus, bailout, regulatory policies, and the rest. President Obama came out a month ago and said if the U.S. didn't get stimulus right, the U.S. was going to face global catastrophe. His words, not my words. But what he was also saying was, it doesn't matter what the banks do. It doesn't matter what the automotive companies come up with in terms of plans. It doesn't matter how many hundreds of thousands of people are laid off by the private sector. If Washington doesn't get it right, not Wall Street, certainly not Main Street, K Street, where all the lobbyists are, if Washington doesn't get it right, we've got problems. So I do not want to stand up here in front of you and suggest to you that globalization was a good thing. It wasn't a good thing. It was a thing. Some people liked that thing. 
If you lived in Bangalore, you liked that thing, right? You did well by globalization. If you lived in Detroit, you did not like that thing. I'm not going to stand up in front of you and tell you that a person from Detroit is more important than a person from Bangalore, right? I, I think it is interesting that a majority of Americans do not support free trade today when polled, while a majority of Indians, Mexicans, Turks, Chinese do. That's interesting. It probably will have resonance as we get towards the 2012 US presidential elections, but that's not my point. My point was that in a globalized world, you would figure out your winners and losers on the basis of those economic drivers. Now we are going to see political drivers increasingly determining who the winners and losers will be. That's the first big change from globalization to state capitalism. Second big change, we've been living in a world where the United States has, for better and for worse, been a unipolar power, has been driving, has had the political capital and the willingness to take the lead on provision of public goods around the world. Not everyone would always perceive them as public goods, but nonetheless, to the extent that there has been global leadership on a geopolitical stage, it's largely been the US. That is, of course, increasingly not true. Everyone talks about this. Fareed Zakaria in the US and Kishore Mabubani out in Singapore and the Chinese prime minister and the Russian president. Everyone recognizes that, the rise of the rest. What is replacing US leadership on a global stage? The conventional wisdom is multipolarity. I disagree. Multipolarity implies that a number of different countries have different views, sometimes competing, sometimes complementary, on the way the world system should be run. I see non-polarity, where increasingly there is an absence, an abdication of willingness to take leadership on key global issues. So do I see the G20? I increasingly see the G naught. And I think that is a reality. Um, the G20 is not useless. And we can talk about the G20. I would like to because it's here in the backdrop. Um, but to be clear, when I look at Russia, I see a country that has a very strong interest in the way Russia is run, an abiding interest, a stronger interest than anyone else. I see a country that has a very strong interest in the way its region should be run, and sometimes with disagreements with some of the other countries in the region, say Ukraine or Georgia or say Norway over the North Pole. But Russia does not have a particular interest in collective security in Iraq or Afghanistan. Russia does not have a particular interest in creating a new non-proliferation regime. Russia does not have a particular interest in leadership on climate change globally nor do they have a particularly strong interest in creating a new financial architecture globally. Rahm Emanuel came out six months ago, the chief of staff for Obama, and he said, this crisis is too large an opportunity to be missed by the United States. Not true. Most Republicans and Democrats in Congress are engaging in business as usual, in politics as usual. And we see that when Geithner does not have a single political appointee in Treasury after two months of serving. I'm not blaming Obama. McCain would have had the same problem. Hillary would have had the same problem. I am simply suggesting that we're in a world that we increasingly see a lack, a vacuum of that leadership. Now, here's the most important point. If you take away nothing else from my talk today, take this away, is that if we are in a world that is increasingly being driven by state capitalism and by non-polarity, those are two systems that are not in equilibrium. They are systems that will not respond well to global challenges. They are systems that will create their own shocks until those shocks are sufficiently great that a new system is moved towards. Let me give you an example nuclear proliferation, very stark one. Don't know if how many of you agree with my formulation on where the world is moving, but every one of you will agree with what I'm about to say. The world's non-proliferation regime is broken. We all agree with that. Yes? Yes. Nods. Um, 
The United States told the North Koreans a couple years ago that if they tested a nuclear weapon, the U.S. was going to be very, very angry. The North Koreans, that's what the North Koreans said. Yes, that's right. <laughs> North Koreans tested a nuclear weapon. The palpable anger in Washington was present, and nothing happened. And then the Chinese told the Americans, we told you to buy them off. And the Americans said sheepishly, yes, you're right. We should buy them off. We bought them off. They have nukes. Please don't make too many more. They probably made about eight. And that's OK. All right? We're OK with that, eight nukes. Um, Iran is now moving towards nuclear capacity. I'm not saying they're going to test a weapon, but they're moving towards nuclear capacity. Maybe the Israelis will attack them. They have a new government that's right wing, Netanyahu, talks about Iran even when the talk is supposed to be about pensions. I attended one of those recently. Start about pensions, last 15 minutes. Existential threat of Iran cannot be tolerated. It's possible, it's possible they will attack Iran. It is more likely than the markets think, but it's not likely. It's not 50%. It is a fat tale. Okay? Uh, it's one of the great things about the name of the book. You get to promote it all the time, just insidiously. You know? um, assuming that the Israelis don't attack them, the Iranians will develop nuclear capacity as well. And other countries will continue to proliferate. Now, I don't think anyone thinks that's a good or stabilizing thing. Now, is that ever going to change? Sure. I can give you scenarios where that will change. Let's look at Russia. Here's a country with lots of radiological material that's not accounted for. Here's a country that has lots of scientists with the capacity to use that radiological material that are unemployed. And there is an indigenous terrorist network that has tried in the past to acquire radiological material to create bombs. So I can imagine a scenario where you put those three together, the trifecta of dirty bombness, and you see a big bomb in Moscow, doesn't kill a lot of people, but terrorizes the city, overwhelms the social fabric, the government falls, and oil production goes off a cliff impact in the global economy. I can, I can imagine that. I have a vivid imagination. I can imagine that happening. Now, the, if that were to happen, I think the United States would get serious on proliferation. They'd go to Israel and say, you know what? You've got to admit to having 200 nukes, and you've got to let inspectors in. And the Germans would go to the Iranians. And they'd say, you know what? Sanctions on all of this trade and no more of this fooling around with dual-use technologies. And the Chinese would go to North Korea and say, we are going to board and inspect every damned ship because we can't tolerate this. Now, the good news is I don't believe that Russia scenario is very likely. I don't even think it's a fat tail. I think it's a thin tail. It's more likely than it was five years ago. It's probably going to be more likely in five years, but it's not that likely. The bad news is, short of that kind of a shock, I do not believe we should expect to see effective leadership globally on the proliferation regime. And I am suggesting to you that there are analogies around things like climate change and financial architecture and collective security that we should think about in terms of who the winners and losers in the global economy will be. President Obama, with all of his international support around the world, and it is significant, was not able to drum up much support, even from his special friend here in the UK, for additional exposure in Afghanistan. So as a consequence, despite the fact that this was his one foreign policy priority when he came in, he's had to basically give up on Pakistan as anything the US can do anything about in the next year or two. And he's seriously limited what his expectations are for Afghanistan, effectively saying it's going to have to get a lot worse before it can possibly get better. We'll see more of this. A world that is going to be more nonpolar and more state capitalist is a world that will have less efficient global economic growth. It is a world that we will see more regionalization of capital flows as opposed to globalization of capital flows. And it's a world where politics will decide and, and define more winners and losers. What are the fat tails today? And what are the countries that are relatively resilient? I see three big fat tails out there over the next 18 months. And by the way, if I'm advising, we advise hundreds of clients around the world, advising corporations 
I'm telling them your 10-year scenarios, your five-year scenarios that you spent a lot of time on, don't spend a lot of time on those. Because in this environment, you can't do very much with a five or 10-year scenario. It's increasingly impossible to know where the world's going to be. But your 18-month scenarios are much more important. As long as you understand that the breadth of those 18-month scenarios are much, much greater than they were six months ago. The possibility of serious discontinuities, the necessity of stress testing your investments and models in some of these countries around the world. So with that in mind, what are the fat tails I see over the next 18, 24 months as we work our way through this global recession? Three big fat tails. First, the new capitals of capital. The simple fact that allocations are going to be made economically from political, not commercial centers around the world. I mentioned the fact that Geithner couldn't get <coughs> any appointments through in the first couple months. It was singularly unfortunate that this financial crisis began in, uh, in September when the US was in the middle of an election because half of Obama, half of, uh, of uh, Paulson, Secretary of Treasury Paulson's uh, political appointees were already gone. The other half were looking for jobs. I got some of those CVs. You can't run a government that way. Congress was much more interested in ensuring that they could secure their reelection than they were in expeditiously looking at, reading, and passing a stimulus package. Let's be clear. Despite the fact that you are facing the world's worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, this is not just a problem in the United States. Go to the United Arab Emirates. You wanted to make money there a year ago, you went to Dubai. Five years ago, you went to Dubai. Why? That's where they were building the skyscrapers. That's where the money was. That's where the decisions were being made. Not anymore. You used to go to Dubai. They said, Dubai this, Dubai that. I was in Dubai recently. They stopped saying Dubai. You don't, there is no Dubai. They say the Emirates. What happened to Dubai? No, no, no. That's what we're doing, the Emirates. In Abu Dhabi, they are bemused by this. <laughs> but Abu Dhabi runs the show. They just gave 10 billion, the first tranche of aid to Dubai. More is coming. It will certainly ensure that Dubai will not crater in the same way that being a part of the EU will ensure that Hungary and Poland does not crater and will not ensure that Ukraine or Turkey does not crater, right? Um, but that's going to cause inefficiencies <coughs> because if you are in Adia or Mubadala, the big sovereign wealth funds in Abu Dhabi. Used to be, if you were a private equity guy based in New York, you'd fly over to Abu Dhabi, you'd meet your buddies that used to be on Wall Street that were the new portfolio managers in those sovereign wealth funds. You'd show them your fancy pie charts and your flip charts, and you'd say, we need some money, and they'd look at it, and they'd say, yes or no. Now, those portfolio managers from the West have been fired or marginalized. The decisions are being made by the political leaders, and they have less cash, and very clear priorities. Priority number one, bail out Dubai. Priority number two, ensure stability of the UAE. Priority number three, think about that in the context of the broader Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC in the region. And then you can play with the West, or China, or emerging markets, or anything else. Those are politicized priorities. They're not necessarily worse priorities but they are not priorities that maximize profitability. Now, again, to be clear, the old system of fetishized hypercapitalism and super leverage did, did prioritize profitability, frequently short-term profitability and compensation at the expense of long-term profitability. Instead, we are prioritizing short-term political gain at the expense of long-term economic profitability. That is important because it is clearly negative for the US dollar. To the extent that the US and the Chinese are married, and the Chinese are increasingly telling the Americans they think our kids are unattractive, which no one likes to hear, we're going to have an increasingly difficult time securing China purchasing US treasuries. And even in places like Japan, folks like Nomura are going to be looking at what's happening in Abu Dhabi and in Russia and in China, and they're going to say, wow, they're not going to be buying as many dollars, so I should be short the dollar as well. That's going to have an impact on the global economy. There's no question.
Um, that's the first fat tail. Second fat tail, plain vanilla geopolitical risk. We've dealt with it for a long time. We're going to continue to deal with it. Um, but the interesting point is, first of all, a lot of the major geopolitical risks in 2009, 2010 are a little larger than they were in 2008. In particular, South Asia. In particular, Israel, Iran, Lebanon. If you were going to have strikes, certainly more likely in the next 18 months than over the last 18. Mexico, narco cartels declaring open war against Calderon and the state of Mexico, clearly worse this year than last year. Now, Iraq is getting better. Ironically, that's, one, that's the one geopolitical center of risk that actually isn't as big in 09 than it has been the last couple of years. But the real point here is that the markets aren't paying attention to it. When oil was at 147, there was a premium, an Iran premium, in a barrel of oil. When oil is at 50, there is not. So if anything happens, it is a bigger surprise to the markets. It has a larger impact. And the ability and willingness of international leaders to respond will also be limited because of the distraction of the global financial crisis. So that's the second risk. Final fat tale out there is that when you have a severe economic downturn, of course, in many markets around the world, that leads to social discontent, which causes political instability, social revolution, coups, regime change, and the rest. But it's a lagging indicator. It doesn't happen immediately. Historically, usually these things take 12 to 18 months to actually play through their respective countries. I'm talking about emerging markets primarily, not developed states. But we haven't seen it yet, is my point. And there are a number of countries out there that are going to experience severe dislocations as that social instability hits. A few that I'm worried about, Russia in particular, Ukraine, Turkey, Argentina, Venezuela, Nigeria, Egypt, Thailand. Those would be some of the highest on my list. Those are your fat tails. Now let me end on an optimistic note. Because I do think that in this environment, there's also lots of opportunity. Where do I see resilience? Where around the world do I really believe that countries are going to be well-placed to outperform expectations in the context of this downturn? A few I would talk about. Number one, China. The question will be whether or not Chinese outsized growth compared to market expectations is something the West will be able to take advantage of. That's an open question. But China has much more reserve of social stability and ability to drive growth, in my view, than the markets generally understand. Number two, the Gulf, particularly Saudi Arabia, which is one of the best stories out there in terms of comparative trajectory. We can talk about that in Q&A and discussion. But also broadly in the Gulf, uh, Qatar, uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi. Number three, Brazil. Over 80% approval right now for President Lula. A consolidation of the political sec uh, spectrum and willingness to tolerate short-term pain for long-term benefit and economic policy, not to mention the fact that the Saudi Arabia biofuels and they have one of the world's largest new oil finds just offshore. And then fourth, India, which is probably the world's slowest moving good story, <laughs> but has a lot of resilience and doesn't have a lot of serious social instability that will affect them at the macro level. 